in terms of letting us know you're still there. I know you can still see us all um, and we're just going to get going again. So um, we're learning loads. So if anyone wants a debrief on how to do a webinar, just give us a shout afterwards. Um, so I was saying um, the kinds of things we're going to hear about today. And I think I've just been saying that we're going to hear about government reform. In terms of family law, we're going to hear about what our nearest neighbours in England and Wales, how they reoriented their family law sector to be more child-centred. We're going to hear a bit about how the courts have responded during COVID and how they've innovated. And we're also going to think about what could happen if we did enough energy, vision and resources to make Ireland's family law system safer for children and parents. We're going to try and make this um, a little bit interactive. We're going to have a couple of polls during the session. Um, for you to vote in and we're also going to have a Q&A whole session of that at the end um, which is going to be uh, moderated by um, Sinead Gibney so you can use the Q&A button at the end of the screen to send in questions um, and Sinead then will go through them and try and group them and direct them to the right person. Um, if you want to put your name or organisation in it to give us a bit of context, do, but you're also welcome to put in um, anonymous questions as well. So just to tell you a little bit about One Family, I'm sure lots of you know who we are, but some of you may not. We're Ireland's organisation for people who are parenting alone, sharing parenting and separating. And we have a whole range of specialist family support services to help people in these situations to do their best in very difficult circumstances sometimes. Um, the most relevant service, I suppose, around to family law issues is called um, Separating Well for Children and it's funded by TUSLA. And we have a whole range of services that help separated families who are in conflict um, to be able to work together and to move forwards. Um, so those services include play and art therapy for children, talking counselling for adults and adolescents, mediation and parenting supports. Um, and whilst this project is available in Dublin, it's completely oversubscribed, as you can imagine, and actually it's needed all around the country. And um, we're also interested in the policy side, of course, of family law, which is why we're running today's seminar. And we advocated for the draft legislation and um, for the reform of the family law courts to be included in the programme for government. So we're really pleased that it's there, along with commitment for the building of the Hammond Lane Family Law Court Centre as well. Um, we had originally organised this event to be in May, uh, in person in a building where we'd all be together touching elbows. Um, so look, we're really pleased that the speakers have stayed with us and come back. And we hope that this is going to be the first of a number of events actually um, around family law, because there just seems to be so many things that people are concerned about and that we could spend a bit of time thinking about. Um, so I'm going to hand over to our first speaker, who's Una Buckley. Una is the Deputy Secretary Jen in the Department of Justice. Not sure if it's still got equality in the title, Una, um, but she has, it does for, for this week, um, she has responsibility for development, implementation and review of policies and programmes around civil law reform, the court system, legal aid and access to justice. So really relevant stuff. And she also oversees the management of a number of relationships with other agencies and bodies, including the court service. And uh, Una, I think you originally trained as a barrister, so you're very familiar with um with this uh, area um so i'm going to hand over to una thank you uh, thanks very much karen and, and hopefully you can hear me um yes i may have trained as a barrister but ironically i never did family law uh, mainly because as a very as a very young uh, female law student i was advised very strongly to do family law because that's what all the girls did and as a consequence, I refuse point blank to do it. So there's a certain amount of irony that I'm involved in this reform, um, but it's one that um, I'm, I'm very invested in. So I'm, I'm very hopeful that we will be able to get this off the ground. Um, so thank you very much to One Family uh, for, for um, giving me the opportunity to talk to you about these proposals. Um, so I want to just do an initial word of warning. Um, although we have briefed the minister, our, our new minister, Minister McEntee, a couple of times uh, so far. It's been at a very high level. She hasn't had an opportunity, obviously, given it's only day three or so, to wrap her head around the details of these proposals. Um, and we will be sitting down with her fairly soon to go through them and hopefully then with a view to taking um, a memorandum to government at a very early stage. Um, in point of fact, we were, uh, we were most unfortunate. We had a memo ready to go to government in January. Um, 
and uh, then the election was called. So we were, um, we ended up having a six month hiatus while we waited for the formation of government. So if you ever felt the country could be run without a government, this is a very live example about why that isn't actually true. You do need a government to make major policy changes of this nature. And what we are proposing is a very big change in, in the way in which the courts handle family law. So it is important that, that there is a, a very comprehensive understanding of this at, at, at government level. So just, um, so I suppose just to say that we're very hopeful that this will be one of the reform items that the Minister submits to government and that it would become part of the first 100 days um, approach. So the, just to quickly go through, again with that health warning, this is what the officials are proposing to the Minister. Um, the department has prepared proposals for a new approach to handling family law cases in Ireland at district, circuit and high court levels. These proposals include legislation to create a new dedicated family court within the existing court structures. And these courts will have new procedures aimed at a less adversarial resolution of disputes and include appropriate facilities and case management arrangements. In terms of its genesis, obviously law, family courts and as a concept is around for a very long time and indeed as far back as 1975 the law reform commission's first program made a commitment to consider the question of the best type of judicial or court structure structures appropriate to deal with uh, the different matters that fall under the general heading of family law and the 90s saw an increase in in interest in this happening with a, a number of reports including by uh, Carol Coulter, of course, has been uh, involved in this. There was an all-party Rockless Committee on the Constitution, 10th report on the family suggestors and so forth. And then um, the programme for government, for the government of 2011 to 2016, contained a commitment to establish a distinct and separate system of family courts to streamline family law court processes and make them more efficient and less costly. So I know, Karen, that you and your colleagues are very happy to see another commitment to the current programme for government, but just a word of warning, commitments and programs of government are one thing you actually do need the endeavor to to get it across the line as well it was originally envisaged that a separate family court would be established by way of referendum to amend section 34 article 34 of the constitution however following examination it was determined to be unnecessary as the family court could instead be established as a separate division within the existing court structures so a district family court a circuit family court and a family high court um, and when I arrived in the department uh, nearly two years ago now, I took over an existing working group comprising officials from the Department of Justice and Quality, the Court Service, and the Legal Aid Board, and uh, subsequently expanded to include representatives of the Department of Children and Youth Affairs. Um, and that group has been examining the operational aspects of the family court and the overall architecture of the family court structure, as opposed to the detail of the legislation, if I can put it that way. Because this is a very all-encompassing change. It, it, it really is. It it's, goes far more than just a simple legal change. That's the easy bit, actually. The very hard bit is the change in structures, the operational side, the provision of facilities, the use of courthouses, and indeed the oversight of that. And uh, I know Peter is going to be speaking to you with a great deal of detail and, uh, about the, the actual on the ground side of things. So I won't go into that. And I should also say that the act of engagement of the judiciary is, crit is key to delivering this successfully. So to that end, uh, the interest of President Daly um, is really, really important. Uh, and we're very grateful for his, his support on this. So the policy framework which is, um, has informed this legislative proposal, um, it focuses on overhauling the current court structures to provide for a dedicated family court system with user-friendly friendly family district and circuit court centres located around the country. It's envisaged that the new family court system will facilitate the development of specialist judicial expertise and case law in the family law field, and therefore it be broadly in line with the key structural recommendations of the Law Reform Commission report on family courts from 96. Um, the establishment of more efficient and user-friendly family courts is part of a larger package of measures to create a system that is responsive to the needs of families who require legal decisions in a non-adversarial environment that provides access to specialist supports. And a crucial aspect of the package will involve the Mediation Act becoming properly mainstreamed to encourage the use of alternative dispute resolution and family law proceedings. Um, so just harking back to that Law Reform Commission report, even though it was published um, 14, 15 years ago, it still has relevance today in highlighting the key elements which need to be reflected in the design of a family court system. Um, a system which is responsive to the need of the many kinds of family structure which uh, exist in our modern society. And not surprisingly, many of those elements were reflected again in the recently published Joint Committee report on reform of the family law system. So a key element is that it should be accessible and capable of responding in a speedy manner to the requirements of those it's intended to serve. 
uh, reflective of the fact that families need to be at the center of a redesigned system. It's vital that the services offered by that system are within reasonable geographic proximity to the consumer and that they are affordable. The system must also be capable of delivering on procedures which are reasonably simple and comprehensive. Um, and appropriate information or advice must be readily available to those who need it and where necessary, legal or other representation should also be readily available. Any new system must have regard to the breadth of family interventions which it will be called upon to address. And traditionally, family law has been seen as having a focus on relationship breakdown and on the need to address the consequences of same, including matters such as custody of children and maintenance. And recognition has also been given to the need to address public law issues around child welfare. However, a modern family law system also needs to be responsive to the needs of other family, vulnerable family members, such as adults with dementia, uh, other physical or intellectual disabilities, which are existing court-based structures quite ill-equipped Ill to deal with really at the moment. Um, and it also needs to be responsive to the fact that on occasion there, there are likely to be multiple sets of proceedings involving the same family members. And notwithstanding the fact that emotions may be charged, a responsive family justice system should make every attempt to avoid adversarial approaches and to support where feasible the maintenance of family relationships. And I'm very much looking forward to hearing Anthony's um, address because I know he has some very interesting figures about how many disputes in families are able to be diverted away from the courts and resolved at an earlier stage. Compassion and respect need to be fundamental in any new system, particularly where vulnerable parties, that's children and adults, of course, are concerned. And to that end, a philosophy aimed at promoting agreement cooperation is crucial. Thus, while recognizing that some cases will inevitably end up in court, a key policy objective should be to reduce those cases to a minimum, or at least to reduce the exposure which the parties may have to an adversarial courts process. And the possibility to avail of mediation must be embedded in the new court system and individuals empowered so that they can, with the appropriate supports, have the confidence necessary to engage in negotiation and come to their own agreements where that's feasible. So many obviously who engage with the family law system will have legal representation. Many of those lawyers are on, this, uh, on the seminar today, but it must also be recognized as a cohort of lay litigants who will need additional supports and this needs to be factored into the design of the new system too. So the provision of family court information centers to provide information to these litigants on matters such as supports available to families in crisis, guidance related to court appearances, and information on the availability and purpose of mediation. And that's, those centers could be relevant even where parties are likely to avail of legal representation. So linked in with this is the desirability of the new family court system being resourced by those who have specialist training in dealing with families in crisis. And this concerns not just the judiciary, but also extends to lawyers, court staff, and all other personnel who may have contact with such families when they enter into the system. So to summarize the policy priorities, um, it's access to the system, location of key points of contact when it comes to determining what course of action to take, availability of alternatives to litigation where this is practical and appropriate, education as the supports which are available, an integrated network of professionals, including the judiciary, which are equipped with the requisite skills to manage the problems which will inevitably confront them, the creation of appropriate linkages so that multiple family law proceedings involving the same family can be facilitated and follow up in terms of enforcement where a decision is given. So as you can see from that description, it goes well beyond writing a piece of legislation. It's, 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 a, it's a much more comprehensive reform required. But how are these policies reflected in the legislation? Um, so the new approach will be uh, to handling family law cases will be by creating a new dedicated family court within the existing court structures. Um, the general scheme aims to stream, streamline family law court processes, um, clarify jurisdictional issues, and provide for a set of guiding principles to help ensure that the family court will operate in a user-friendly and efficient manner, and as well as supporting the Mediation Act by encouraging use of alternative dispute resolution mechanisms. Um, I just want to talk about timing as well. If it's approved by government, it's referred then to the Office of Parliamentary Council for drafting, and the heads of the bill are published and um, sent to the Rockless Committee for scrutiny. And just to say that that process obviously can take some time. Uh, it's not a quick process because it needs to be got right. Um, and but during that time, there will be further opportunities for people to get involved in the drafting of the heads of the bill, um, NGOs, the judiciary, and so on and so forth. So we'd expect that there be further consultations in that time. Uh, although I would be hopeful that there'd be a reasonable amount of, of support on both sides of, of the House for this reform. I don't think that there's any particular political issues around it, and I think it would be something that um, all parties ultimately will probably support, given its support for families. 
Um, the bill will streamline the family law processes to be more efficient, more user-friendly, and deliver greater use of alternative dispute resolution where possible. They clarify jurisdictional issues. Currently, family law cases are dealt with by the district, circuit, and high courts. Under the new court structure, the attention that the judges of the circuit family court will have the requisite training and specialist knowledge to deal with complex separation and divorce issues, notwithstanding the value of the assets um, of the parties, but that the family high court would retain its appellate jurisdiction in such cases. And it should also be possible for the district court to have jurisdiction in straightforward cases where mediation has been successful and the role of the court is merely to approve a settlement which has been reached between the parties. Um, the family high court would retain jurisdiction over adoption and child abduction cases. Thirdly, it is proposed that legislation establishing the family court would provide for a set of guiding principles applicable to all of the parties to help ensure the court will operate in a user-friendly and efficient manner. These principles could, for example, relate to encouraging and facilitating, where appropriate, the resolution of issues in dispute by means of um, ADR in non-domestic violence cases. The principles could also relate to promoting and engaging in active case management practices, such as setting time limits for submissions. Finally, the principles could relate to conducting proceedings in a manner which identifies issues in dispute and minimizes, as far as possible, conflict between the parties. Judges with expertise in family law would be assigned on a full-time basis to both the district family court and the circuit family court for renewable terms. And we do um, understand, and just in case uh, President Daly is concerned, we have it in our heads that's going to mean additional judges. So that's part of the uh, proposals that we'll, that we'll have to, we'll have to work through what additional means in this context. Um, and then in order to make the family courts more user friendly, it's the intention that the family court will sit to hear family law and childcare proceedings in a different building or a different room from that in which other court sittings are held or on different days or at different times or other court settings. So it won't be mixed in with regular district court criminal business, for example. Um, obviously, this is a major reform. It will parallel the reforms being proposed that we are expecting to come out of President Kelly's review, uh, former President Kelly's review um, of civil law more generally. Um, and there may be aspects of those reforms that flow across into the family law reform or, or vice versa. Um, and obviously, that, that, that I, I sit on that review group also. So um, we're hoping that those proposals will be published actually within the first 100 days too, but in September. Um, I just want to re-emphasize as I finish up, this is a very substantial change. It is not possible to be done by the department. It, is, uh, it will have to be done by everybody working together, including with all the stakeholders, including the professions, will have to be part of, of this change. And um, very much hope that we will be able to deliver it. It's long promised um, and uh, with a fair wind and a following breeze, we'll get it across the line um, in the next little while. Thank you very much. Thanks, Karen. Thanks, Una. That's great. And um, just to say, there's lots of questions coming in, which we really appreciate. If you can put them through the Q&A, that's even better for us. Um, so thank you for that. We're going to do our first poll. This is just um, to get a sense of what all of you out there think um, about the issue of these um, new, proposed new family law courts. Um, so I think we have two questions and they should pop up in a moment. There we go. So um, these are anonymous, so we don't trace these back in any way. So we're interested to know how important is it to you that specialist family law courts are developed around the country under the proposed legislation? You might not give a hoot. It might be very important. So we're interested in what you think. And how satisfied are you that these new family law courts will only be available regionally? Um, and I suppose what that means is rather than one being in every town, they will be more in uh, regions. Um, so is that a good thing in your view? Is, um, that, uh, is that not satisfactory in your view? So if you want to vote, we'll come back to the results of those later on um, in the session. So I'm now delighted um, to welcome our uh, keynote speaker today, who's Anthony Douglas. Um, Anthony um, was the former CEO of CAFCAS, which is um, a, an organisation in England and Wales, which you tell us a bit about. And um, um, sorry, lost my notes there. Um, and he ran that for 15 years. And he's going to tell us a little bit about how in the last 10 years, they re-engineered really how they provide the family law system um, to really focus on children's safety and well-being. Anthony is not only a social worker, but he was also formerly a journalist and economist and um, 
has been very publicly recognised and awarded for his work. Um, so we're delighted that he's able to join us today and to share his expertise and thoughts with us as we're just starting out on this journey. Thanks, Anthony. Thanks, Karen. Can you all hear me okay? Well, it's, um, it's great to be with you. And um, I wanted to start by giving a message of um, hope that um, if you've been waiting 25 years for this moment, um, it's taken us about 10 to 15 years to achieve some degree of change. So when uh, Una talked about a political consensus over time, um, your work in family law will have to go on through several successive administrations. Uh, so it's hugely important to have a culture of urgency and a momentum and to build a passion about family law reform and a group of you who are totally committed and see it through. Or if you stop, you pass it on. I'm going to try to also answer some uh, questions as they come up. There's one about parental alienation. And uh, that's interesting because that is an example of what's taken us about 10 years. We've now just recognized it legally. It started as a massive uh, political and policy dispute about whether it existed. It then became polarized between pressure groups about either it did or it didn't. And then finally, we started to operationalize it, recognizing, of course, it happens. It doesn't matter what it's called. What matters is the impact on children. And once we started to define the issue, not as policy, but in terms of adverse behaviors and experiences for children, the ground became slightly easier to navigate, um, leading to the inclusion uh, now in some of the measures around domestic abuse. Some more examples of those that we're looking at um, later this year are cross-ticketed judges in childcare and family law cases and criminal cases, crucially. So that for domestic abuse, you would have one family, one judge in the criminal case and the family law case who would be ticketed to hear both and would attempt to combine the issues. Hugely difficult in terms of traditional jur um, jurisdiction, uh, jurisprudence and um, adversarial processes and fair processes. But what's underpinning this is a belief we've got to, that unless we institutionalize therapeutic justice and the programs that make a difference to children, we won't be serving children well. In family law work, there are no winners and losers, just children caught in the middle. The headlines of what I'm going to say, and I'm going to finish at about five to four, which was the brief to, uh, to allow us to be on time. Um, so I'm just going to give some messages from our experience in the UK, and I've tried to make them relevant to what you're looking at in Ireland. The first is, I think, the distinction between child, and child care and family law cases is a false one and not a reflection of real lives or the way people are living them. Particularly the emotional harm suffered by children in family law cases. You will have thousands of adults in Ireland who bear the invisible scars of conflicts at home. We still have people coming through to us telling about what happened to them. They're now in their 80s. But before they die, they want to try to, even then, with their parents dead and with no one else um, sometimes who knows about it, to resolve some of the issues they've carried for their whole life. So these are not cases, these are not children who should be on a huge list in a remote court where childcare cases take massive priority. Admittedly, the decision to take a child away by the state is one of the largest in any political system and legal system, but you must develop an equality between the two types of law, especially as family law is the poor relation anyway of other branches of the law. Uh, Una's right about getting the legislation and the regulations right. We had sufficient legislation, but it was only when we developed what we call a child arrangements program, which is the operational arm of the, of the legislation, that we really began to shorten case duration, 
shorten the number of hearings, build in a proper system for risk assessments in every case, which I'll cover a little bit, and to start to be able to focus on child impact and child outcomes. So you've got a great opportunity to learn from all of the mistakes we've made, as well as one or two of the successes. And just to mention that internationally, in the legislation, Australia, for example, brought in family law centres. Uh, within five years, they had to modify their legislation because they found they'd gone too far away from child protection and risk assessment and too much into supporting families. So there's a balance to be struck. Um, I rather like the Israeli system where you can't get into court with a family law application unless you really seriously attempt mediation or dispute resolution in a four week window. So your application is paused and you only get past the threshold if you've made a genuine attempt to sort the issues out. It's like a prenuptial for children, not just money, as if you have any money. And uh, after the last few months, you'd be forgiven for that being an, another difficulty as well. But on the money, it's really important to say that we had to improve performance despite having double the work and less money. And that does sharpen thinking. Um, the only lever we had was some diversion from court, but fundamentally by reorganizing the way cases were dealt with in court, shortening the number of hearings, shortening the time cases took, and being more decisive um, rather than letting some children be in limbo for half of their lives. If I were going to start anywhere, I would say start with public health messaging. You have public health messaging about road safety, don't drink too much, um, don't take too many drugs, and so on. But looking after your children post separation is just as important as a public health message. And again, if I was starting somewhere, I'd put what limited money there might be, perhaps for pilots, into dispute resolution services. They're cheap, helplines are overwhelmed, they're extremely effective. And to bring the helpline culture from the voluntary sector, from NGOs into state administration, um, in our experience, has been crucial. Next slide, please, Noel. We can make the presentation available. I've written it for that purpose. So I'm just going to say a little bit about CAFCAS. We are the largest statutory voice of the child service in the world. I'm 100% funded by the governments of England and Wales, sponsored by the Ministry of Justice. We can only work in courts or at the edge of court. And the edge of court means an application is imminent. We were formed from 117 predecessor organi organizations. So don't worry, um, my experience of managing how you absorb 117 separate family justice cultures into one is really to have a strong national identity and culture um, that practitioners and parents welcome, quite like, because it works, and can see the vision and principles behind it. That's fine, but if you don't start delivering practical improvements within 18 months, disillusionment comes back. This is a sector known for long-term disillusionment. You're always on the edge of that because it's emotional labor, complicated work, and it doesn't feel ever that you've made a good decision. Hardest of all for judges who rarely know what happens a year or two after their decisions in the most worrying of cases. What we have to do um, is recognize that in around 50 to 60 percent of family law cases, and that's an international measure, not just in England and Wales, domestic abuse and mental health, feature, mental health concerns feature strongly. And if you simply run through these lists in terms of the money in cases or divisions of the assets, you never get close to the lived experience of particularly women and children, sometimes men. Uh, particularly with parental alienation, but mostly with abuse, women, and with children, all of those added up. So you have to have a system that distinguishes those cases from ones that are just about a straightforward dispute resolution. 
think of yourselves as pediatric echocardiographers. They take perhaps 200 pictures of a child's heart to understand a baby's heart disease. We have to do the same from numerous emotional angles to understand what a child is going through. It's complicated, every child is different. When we started out, we didn't really make adequate distinctions between children or between sibling groups. We saw them as casualties of separation, but not as individuals in their own right, some of whom would feel liberated from a conflict at home, but others who would be devastated for the rest of their lives. And remember the well-being of practitioners. This is emotional labour. You have to go at midday, 10 in the morning, 2 o'clock, as if the case is the only case you've ever heard, because for the people involved, it's the, their only chance, and it takes a toll. You need support around you. Next slide, please, Norm. Very quickly, how we operate in England and Wales is a structured application to court. In every case, we produce a risk assessment. It may be that there's no risk, but that we learned after three to four years was a prerequisite. We had too many women being killed by their ex-partners, too much unsupervised access, unsupervised contact, which placed children in danger. And we didn't know enough or understand enough about that. And we've now, 10 or 15 years down the road, got to the point where legally we're revisiting the presumption of parental involvement. That would have been heresy 10 or 15 years ago. But the, the crude fact is, for some children, they are better off without both of their parents. You say that in a childcare case, but not usually in a family law case. And this, of course, is quite rare. But once you start to understand child impact, it takes you into a completely different legal and procedural framework. We're also introducing a presumption of automatic eligibility for special measures for domestic abuse victims in court. That's hugely important, barring cross-examination of victims by their alleged abusers. These very practical steps are hugely important. And along the road, if you're going along this road for, as I hope you will, I'm sure you will, 5, 10, 15 years, things will happen that you cannot possibly predict now that will throw you off course. The biggest one for us was the total reduction in legal aid and legal representation for families. It's meant the rise in people representing themselves has turned judges and effectively into active case managers with families. And the same for our practitioners, it's changed everyone's roles, whether we've liked it or not. It's had pros and cons. But what I think I'd advise in advance is to have a skill set as a judge, a lawyer, a dispute resolver, a social worker, um, a family support worker, a skill set that is increasingly broad that you may only have to use and stop thinking of yourself as your current role, but as a dispute resolver. Everybody in our system is resolving disputes. Next slide, please. Along with the Child Arrangements Programme, which sets out in great detail how the system works, including reducing the number of hearings, these are some of the other changes we've had to make. Firstly, a National Family Justice Board chaired by ministers it's, if you like, the implementation mechanism with political empowerment that mandates change and strengthens the voice of ministers inside government. We have 42 local family justice boards. You wouldn't need that many, perhaps five or six, um, going by geography. And a family justice young people's board that's quite influential and also works with ministers. Some of the strategic changes we've made 100 page court reports down to a five or 10 page child impact analysis. And then this rule that we always go by in trying to keep the system redesigning itself. The 30, 45, 25 rule. 30% of cases don't need to be in court at all. And, but we still don't have the infrastructure to keep them out. 45% can be resolved very quickly within four weeks. 20% need therapeutic interventions. Um, we have a three or four session program 
that's been pretty successful. And then 5% are the most intractable cases that you can make absolutely no generalizations about. And you're looking at it on a case by case basis and will usually take much longer. But even then, we want to apply a public law timescale of a maximum nine to 12 months on those cases. Remote working is, off, is certainly offering some opportunities with the 30 to 40 and the 45% group. So in terms of how you use your resources, I'd say concentrate on the last 25%, the difficult cases, raise the threshold for entry to court. Some of our 45% of cases are being dealt with in telephone risk assessments, consent orders signed off by judges in box work. It is possible to get to that system much quicker than we've done using the research that's around and the experience. Next slide, please, Noel. I won't repeat, I think, what I've said here. Um, the only point I'd bring out is, uh, well, two, work with campaigners and pressure groups. Talk, with, take, carry the sector with you. Carry the sectors. It's not simply one. There are lobbies. Um, they're hugely important. They talk to politicians. They raise individual cases. They challenge the status quo. That's hugely important. And then the devil's in the detail. We're at the moment working on disclosure requirements, probably for about the 50th time. It's really, really hard to get the detail right. Next slide, please. And now I'm going to do a whistle stop tour through some of the child focused tools um, we use in England, England and Wales to understand the voice of the child and to support courts and judges to understand the voice of the child in the shortest possible time. Relationship based practice. You have to, in brief work, establish a relationship instantly, sometimes remotely. A child impact analysis has been a hugely powerful tool, and I'll show you our template for that. Effectively, it means we don't start with the parent stories, but through the lens of the child, we understand the parent story. Because you might classify domestic abuse as high impact, and it would be in criminal terms or for the adult, but the, the impact on the child is differential. We know over 90% of children are affected by domestic abuse, but we need to understand in what way and therefore with what outcomes are the interventions focused. Trauma-informed practice, there's much more trauma in private law cases than you realize when you start. A restorative practice, often rather than severing relationships, your work is to try and restore them to where they were before they began to go wrong. People didn't, people started in love. They fell out of love. Um, the people they saw as saints became monsters. And I'm not saying you can restore that status quo, but um, to try to take families a little way back is important. And to do that, you have to have motivational interviewing, motivational lawyering. And that's why you'd struggle with an adversarial model. It's hard to be motivational if you're adversarial. Um, there are a few cases where access to justice is the only point in the case, but generally we're trying to prevent miscarriages of justice to children. Next slide, please. And this is where the whistle stop tour becomes really whistle stop with just some illustration of tools. Here's our parenting plan. That again has been through about 20 incarnations. We see it as a co-production with parents. It's sent out at the point of application. We support parents to work on it, fill it in together to reach their own arrangements. The goal of our child arrangements program in family law work is to support parents to take the parental responsibility most parents do for themselves. Next slide, please. Um, one question was about our child impact assessment framework. We developed this specifically for parental alienation as a toolkit, but it's used more broadly for other sorts of harmful parenting. So every time I've mentioned, if you like, an idea or a policy, we have an operational tool to back it up for practitioners who are carrying out the work with indicators. These are publicly available. We make them available to parents, to lawyers, so people we work with can see where we're coming from. 
Next one, please. This is our safe contact indicator. If we're saying um, it's not safe to have contact, often it isn't, either in the short term or longer, you have to have a framework for understanding that. Now, checklists don't tell you the whole story. You have to add analysis and professional judgment, but they can help you with the framework. And they can also, as well as helping with the risk assessment, help parents to understand how a judicial decision is arrived at. We have a system which it would be um, probably alien in Ireland, which is that judges need to record reasons why they don't agree with the Kafka's recommendation at court. They do agree with about 92% of recommendations. I'd like to think that's because they're sensible recommendations, but that's part of the check and balance that judges, lawyers, parents can see the evidence base and the rationale for how you arrive at a recommendation. Next slide, please. Similarly, this is our tool for measuring the impact of parental conflict and the differentiation between children. Next one, please. I'm not going to go through the detail of this, uh, but they'll be made freely available, I'm sure, by one family afterwards. Um, we've been, in the last few years, encouraging children with their consent to write directly to judges, and we now routinely incorporate what they say into our court reports and case analysis. So uh, this little boy said, I might want to see, dear judge, I might want to see my dad sometime, but not now because he's scary and he scares my family. Thank you. Now you could probably write about 50 pages on that, but, and I'm not saying children are automatically to be believed, generally they are, um, but sometimes they're manipulated and sometimes they say one thing one week and one the next. And I say that having children and grandchildren as well as being immersed in this work, but nevertheless, take them seriously. Next one, please. This is our case analysis template that will sometimes be a three page report, sometimes four or five page reports. And we say the most important part is the analysis, the professional judgment and the evidence. And I had a wonderful mentor as a, I've written some rather poor textbooks, mostly of which are remaindered, but I had a wonderful mentor called Ruth Rendell, a crime novelist who, um, brilliant, she wrote um, two novels a year into her 80s, tragically died. But she said, start with your best sentence and then your best paragraph. And if you haven't engaged the reader by then, you'll lose them. And tell a story. For judges in particular, if you just read text, it's very, very hard to understand the story of the child. So what we're trying to do in a case analysis is to tell the story. Next slide, please. And then finally, this is a three or four session intervention with our most difficult, we did call them intractable cases, but we've tried to use strengths-based terminology. So the terminology will just be, um, harder to resolve than any others rather than impossible to resolve and we found the minimum positive co-parenting program is three or four sessions and you can see in the sessions that we meet parents individually we're exploring the potential for change we're generally confronting them or helping them to understand the impact of what they're doing on the child we're then meeting with the child separately and inviting the children to communicate with their parents often by letter and more recently we've developed an app in which children are able to communicate that way and actually i think that's probably got applications in the general population for parents who've got teenagers the sort of teenager who goes to their room at 12 and comes down when they're 17 but um, to actually have an app in which you can communicate with family members in the same household is not as crazy as it sounds. And certainly remote working has shown it's possible to heighten communication through these virtual technologies. And then we meet with the parents, feedback what their child has said or is going through, and we then seek the agreement. Now that's a shorthand for a hugely charged and intensive process that 
the most recent experience we've had is showing needs to be shorter rather than longer. So four condensed sessions. And I think this is very much like high impact training in sport. I use the analogy carefully that increasingly we're getting best results from quite straightforward and uncomplicated immersion techniques about an issue um, with short time of inter intervals between the sessions. And by that, I mean four to six weeks. If we have to go to four to six months, we do in some cases, but the, but the faster you can work, the more you can accelerate to the end of the case, the better. And that's my half hour. I'm afraid I've not, I might've got a bit carried away. I haven't really responded as I half promised to the questions in the, um, the chat. I don't know if I've got Karen, a couple of minutes to pick any up or if you'd like to do that in the Q&A. We can do that in the Q&A. We've been collecting them because there's been a lot coming in there as well, Anthony. Okay. So we're happy with that. All right. So can I just say I'm kind of exhausted after listening to that, Anthony, because I'm sorry. You've, no, you've covered so much. It's fantastic. Um, and I and I think what you've you've kind of shown us in Ireland is some of the really intractable things we're stuck on um, that you've already gone past some of the 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 points of conflict we have here by focusing solely on children. And then you've developed really innovative, innovative processes and systems around that. So there's just a massive amount that we can learn from. Um, well, I did wonder whether you could go to the end of the process, not just in England and Wales, but in other, other jurisdictions, to start from the end and not go, go through all of these stages, some of which took us two years, frankly, going around in circles. And that's well, I think you could learn from, from that experience and build a system perhaps in three to five years that took us 10. Yeah, and I think we have, we have shown that on other progressive social issues, we've actually mm. leapfrogged over other countries mm. on a journey to produce something that is better. So I think that's really inspiring and useful. And people have been asking about the slides. We will put them up on the website as well as uh, the recording of Anthony speaking. Um, absolutely. So don't worry about that. They will be available to be shared. So, so just a huge thank you, um, Anthony, for that. And we're going to have a look, um, we're actually we're going to do a second poll now, um, if, uh, if Noel can pop that up. And um, I really want to say roll it there, Noel, um, which of course anyone who lived in 80s Ireland will know why I want to say that, um, because it's not called Colette. So here's a question. Um, who should be the most important people in family law cases, in your opinion? Not who is, but who should be. And look, there isn't a right or wrong answer. We're really not trying to trick anyone. We're genuinely interested in what you think. Who should be? And does, the ch does child safeguarding need to be the central issue in all family law cases, as per the Kafka model, in your opinion? Maybe it should be, but maybe it shouldn't. People have wildly different experiences. So if you can have a vote on that, that would be great. Thank you. So now I get to introduce our next speaker, um, who is Peter Mullen. And Peter is head of Circuit and District Courts and the Court Service. So he's over a lot of, of the court system. Peter previously worked with the Department of Justice and I think was a, a criminal lawyer solicitor, Peter, is that right? Yes. For many years, solicitor. And you're gonna tell us a bit about the Pilot Family Law Centre model because um, the Court Service has actually been working um, in anticipation of the legislation to try and bring about some reforms. So we're really looking forward to hearing what you can tell us about that. Thanks very much, Karen. And uh, if I could ask Noel if he was able to steal one of the slides from Una's presentation, the one headed build of justice, it'll allow you to, because uh, there's a lot of commonality between my presentation uh, and Una's probably because we have been working very closely together for the last year and a half or two years as Una said she's been appointed and uh, we were at a point I think in January where the bill was with the department was, 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 was close to uh, the member going to government and we had done an enormous amount of work around family law centres so you won't be distracted by my bald head and you'll see essentially a, a nice uh, slide and I'm learning through this webinar as well that if you are giving a presentation it's helpful to have a slide because it doesn't distract uh, you can look at the, the presentation etc. My presentation will be available uh, through, uh, through Karen and the team and uh, you can have a look at that when the time comes and if you're all exhausted after Anthony's presentation hopefully 
I won't put you all to sleep, but we'll, we'll try and uh, I'll try and bring a bit of energy to this if I can. I too was absolutely fascinated uh, by by Anthony's presentation, and in particular, yeah, 30, 45, 20, and five. Um, um, numbering that he used and, and the analysis of, of those type of family cases to come in and I, I think uh, while I'm not a family law by, tra by, by training I think that sort of reflects my own experience of what I've seen to date and I think it's something that we need to look at because we need to take that huge percentage of cases away uh, from from the family law system if we can uh, but just to put it into context um, Una has already outlined the provisions of the bill, and I'll do that as well. I'm going to do this all in 15 minutes if I can. I've got a, I've got a clock here in front of me, so I'm going to keep a close eye on that, and I'll try to get through as much as I can. Um, I'm aware that I speak quickly, so that's why you'll all have the benefit of my speech, and you can have a read of it, and I hope it reflects accurately uh, both the terms of the bill, uh, as, as I understand it, the heads of the bill, but also uh, the court services plans in relation to um, how we're going to sort of the family law centres and, and what sort of criteria we've used and what they might look like. Um, I think it's fair to say that we've already, as a court service, indicated um, a broad support for, for the provisions of, of the family law bill. And we are an agency of the Department of Justice, although we're independent in our own way because we, we sort of uh, support and manage the judiciary and the courts. Um, and it, but it's, it's, it's appropriate that we sort of work, work hand in glove, I suppose, on many of these proposals because we will operationalize many, many of the issues uh, that will, will, will be reflected in the bill when the time comes. The proposed legislation, UNA has already uh, given you a basic outline in relation to it. It's the guiding principles, and that's why I wanted this slide put up. It's the guiding principles, I think, that are particularly important because this will under, underpin um, what I hope will be our approach to, to family law. Uh, and when, we talk, when I talk about sort of the family law centres and the architecture that will support that, uh, hopefully we won't have to use a lot of that architecture because we'll have been able to use some of these guiding principles. And the first one, and it's one that was mentioned uh, already by Anthony, was sort of that, that encouragement and using the facility of resolution resolution of issues by alternative resolution and getting getting sort of essentially family law cases out of the family law system and not letting them get into the family law system in the first place. When they do get in there then there's that promoting and engaging the active case management and the roles of judges and practitioners in relation to this is going to be important and it's going to challenge both judges and practitioners because there isn't a lot of that going on presently within within any aspects of, 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 our, of our legal system and I speak as a family lawyer where sorry, as a criminal lawyer, where for many years we've been trying to very actively uh, the, to, to uh, introduce legislation around uh, preliminary trial hearings, uh, and that hasn't happened. And there's no doubt that you know, where, where, where judges get involved at a certain stage, they really can move things along very significantly. But practitioners must very actively involve themselves in that. And I think all of us, uh, uh, as um, me as a former practitioner, and, and many of you who are listening from uh, um, from 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 a legal background, you need to actively engage with that when that time comes. And I think it's incumbent upon you to engage with that, please. Uh, the other issue then I suppose, is that um, you know to try to encourage that proceedings will take place expeditiously and to minimise costs, and that's obvious. And then obviously the rights of uh, and the voice of the child, and that's uh, obviously must be due given due consideration. It's, we're slightly different than our neighbouring jurisdictions in that there's a constitutional uh, right that's been. Uh, for the voice of the child to be heard in relation to that. The draft scheme, as Una has already outlined, uh, envisages the creation of, of a circuit, uh, a specialist family circuit and specialist fa uh, family district courts. Uh, they'll be headed by a principal uh, judge that will be appointed following consultation with the president uh, of the district and circuit courts. And then they, there will be a uh, there sort of there will be a delivery model that would be based on a will be based on dedicated family centres. Uh, based on a regional basis, uh, which will be either purpose-built family centres or where appropriate, where from existing court uh, uh, court service courthouses, and uh, we've done a very high-level assessment of the suitability of much of our courts uh, at the moment, uh, and we've sort of looked at our um, our present accommodation and we've, we've sort of put proposals to the department about how we can improve that as we go on. And then obviously many of you will have heard of Hammond Lane, and that obviously will be dedicated to Family Centre when, when that time comes, when, and, and one hopes that the new administration will, will, deal, will deal with that in due course. The actual family uh, family districts and circuit courts, uh, the, as I've said, there's specific um, dedicated um, um, 
districts uh, will be created for the hearing of family business. The boundaries will, will not reflect the current district boundaries that are there. Uh, and we've done a detailed assessment of the type of family law activity that exists in many of the districts at the moment, and we've tried to realign that as best we can. Um, there will be a need, and, and Una has already said that there will be a need for a, a judicial resources, but there won't be just a need for judicial resources in our infrastructure, there'll be a need for other support services, which I'll talk about in due course. So that will mean increased capacity uh, in our district for, there will be increases in business, business uh, as a result of democratic changes. There'll also be an increase in additional work from um, changes in jurisdiction increases for the district court and there'll be so, so pushing down of some of the work from, from the circuit court to, to, the, from, to the district and similarly I think from the high court to the circuit. Uh, and then obviously then there's, this, there's legislative requirements around the voice of the child and constitutional requirements around that as well. The proposed delivery model, as I've said, is based around dedicated family law centres uh, and there will be one in each district that, that circuit. Um, each centre would have a full suite of support services and essentially they would deal with where there's a dedicated centre would deal with family law business only uh, and where possible. And I think we're going to be able to do that in a number of centres. Uh, and that, and that. However, it's not going to be possible in all of the, of, of the family centres as, as we've already suggested. Uh, where possible, existing courthouses would be utilised for family law business only. Uh, and that's, this will mean the transfer of non-family law business to from one courthouse to an adjoining courthouse in an adjoining county. Um, uh, or alternatively the other way around, so that the criminal business will go the other way. So th th there will be a certain amount of reconfiguring. In certain areas like Cork and Limerick, we have two courthouses, so it will be possible to have a dedicated uh, crime uh, courthouse, which we already do, and then another one that will specialise in family law. And, and we're already uh, looking very actively looking at that. Uh, and in fact, one of our, we had started, and it seems like an age ago when we all Give various variations of this speech is in March. Uh, President Daly invited myself and Una to speak to the district court judges, and uh, literally uh, as COVID was uh, was starting. And we uh, on the way down, I stopped off in Limerick with colleagues from the Legal Aid Board, and I know John McDade is listening. And we, we, we were launching a pilot there of what a dedicated family law uh, service would look like. Uh, and uh, there was an awful lot of work into that. And I'm pleased to say, we, myself and John, have agreed this afternoon. We've tried to kick that off in, in the coming weeks. Obviously, uh, COVID has, has changed things uh, tremendously in relation to it. The dedicated centres, as I've said, would have a, a comprehensive range of support services, uh, courtroom uh, suites and attendant facilities designed for the appropriate hearings of family cases, family law, uh, family friendly reception areas with appropriate um, uh, providing levels of privacy uh, and to encourage discussion or settlement among the parties and any of you who've been in district courts right throughout Ireland uh, that are hearing particularly uh, um, family law applications in the district court will know just how inadequate many of the facilities are uh, right throughout our court infrastructure uh, and we clearly need to work uh, with any improvements in that will, will be encouraged. Public counters and interview rooms will be designed to, for the transaction of business with dignity which we should be doing and uh, we endeavour to do but obviously we have limited resources and then on-site mediation which I've already talk, talked about various of the NGO sector, many of which who you are listening, your support and your facilities, we'll try to facilitate you giving of those um, the support services that you can give to us uh, and to give to litigants within the system, we'll try to facilitate that. And then we'll uh, endeavour, not quite as suspect on the scale of CAFCAS, but uh, whatever we can facilitate in terms of welfare and, uh, uh, and uh, assessment supports to be provided, uh, we'll endeavour to do. And obviously the legal, legal supports there for lay litigants as well. The court venues itself, and I'm going to talk a little bit about this and then I will talk, I'll wind up fairly soon. I'm just conscious of the time that we're running out of time. I'll keep it as tight to 15 minutes as I can. Um, we, what we've done is we, there will be a dedicated family centre. There will be Dublin and probably 12 or 13 approximately right throughout the country. If you, if you know your maths, there's 26 counties, you can work it out. There'll be approximately um, uh, one for every two counties. It'll so work out a little bit different. Um, we've been very engaged with the Legal Aid Board, the Department of Justice, looking at and laterally the Department of Children um, um, to identify appropriate venues. The criteria we looked at were how would we use our, uh, uh, maximize our existing court infrastructure, particularly our PPP structure, infrastructure, which is some of our better courts. And some of the important criteria that we've looked at were, were looking, essentially putting together family law regions based on geography, population, and existing family workloads. 
Uh, we would appraise and determine venues within these regions using criteria including the existing facility scales, conditions, centrality, uh, travel accessibility and public transport links, which is absolutely essential for, for, the, for access to justice. And then um, we, as public servants, we just unfortunately, and it's not unfortunately, it is an obligation to us as public servants, but there is limited resources and we have to um, provide as best facilities that we can within the, within the budget constraints that we have. And I think, unfortunately, we are facing some very difficult years ahead uh, following uh, jury as we, as we go through this COVID crisis and the cost that it has. We've engaged a, a consultant um, to help us in relation to this because, uh, and, they, and, and that consultant's report will actually be available hopefully next week. Uh, and he's going to look at it uh, with this congruence with um, Project Ireland uh, 2040, transport infrastructure and geographical bands, which I've already said. I'm just very conscious of the fact that we're coming to the end of time, and I just want to wind up on a couple of points. Um, the actual title of the actual afternoon. Um, when Karen sort of asked me to, 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 I think, give the speech, and there's no such thing as a free social distance coffee because uh, Karen works close to me and I accepted a social distance coffee from her and um, I ended up doing the speech, so I never accepted a coffee from Karen. But what I think was the learnings from COVID, how to build a family law system for families. So I think that the new family law system, we've heard the proposals, we've heard the ideas around that, and I think that's why I, I spent most of the time talking about that are uh, uh, things that we can learn from COVID. And I just wanted to maybe focus on those uh, for, for, for two more minutes, uh, if I can just indulge you with your time. The learnings from COVID for me are that we, and we are the practitioners, all of us in this virtual room, we're the leaders and the practitioners, we're some of the judges, uh, and we're in the NGO sectors, and we are the influencers and we're the department. We are the leaders in these areas, and we can really influence this debate in a number of ways. The first one is, what, when we talk about alternative dispute resolution, we really mean it. We don't really mean, we, we sort of talk about it, we take a form, and then we go into court and we earn our fees. What we will do is we will actively encourage everybody to become in a process that will, will divert people away from that and get the best process that we can. But equally, when it comes to the choosing of venues, uh, what I've seen in COVID is the importance of leadership. We've looked all around the world, we look at our own Taoiseach and our, and our health services and the great leadership that's been in there. But then equally, we look at where there are other places where there hasn't been great leadership. So when you look, leadership is so important. So when we look at the choice of venues and we pick those venues, I'd ask you all to look at it through a lens of, are these the right choices of venues that have been made with the lens that I've already talked about, which is geographical location, spreading of services, transport infrastructure uh, need. So when we choose Glasgow over Edinburgh, here in Scotland, by the way, but when we choose one over the other, I'm asking you to look at it objectively and not looking at it with a provincial lens and saying, hold on a second, that isn't convenient to me. I want you just to all to provide that leadership to all of the people that you represent or all of the other the voices that, 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 that you're representing. Finally, and I think it's just really important, there's been some incredible innovations that have happened in the court service uh, and right throughout Ireland uh, as a result of, of the challenges of COVID. We've gone to remote hearings for an enormous amount of hearings and in particular there's family law proceedings and President Daly would probably talk about this at length so I won't go on about it, uh, won't, won't talk too much about it. But one of the things that's really been important we've been able to do in Dolphin House is to stagger and schedule cases uh, according to sort of litigants and, and their time and time slots for them. And I think that's been incredibly helpful with sort of this, so instead of a large number of people coming into courthouses at 10.30 for all of their cases, many of whom won't get on until later in the, in the morning or perhaps in the early afternoon, we're doing them in 20 minute slots and it's been hugely successful. And I think we can look at that learning and in talking with, with John McDade earlier, which, which, which I was, is that all of that learning we should be putting into making, operationalizing that on a day-to-day -day basis. All of the good stuff we should be keeping. And if, amazingly, COVID was gone in the morning, we do not and should not go back to all of the things that we were doing before, uh, because some of those things were not good. And there's so much good learning out of this, and let's try and take that good learning, let's try and, and uh, uh, influence the bill as it's going through uh, the Oireachtas and when it becomes, when I have to operationalise it or court service have to operationalise it, uh, when the time comes uh, and hopefully soon, we're able to do that in a way that we achieve the maximum best service for the people involved and to deal with that, going back to that 25, the, the last two bits, the bits that get into court where we have to deal with them. So thanks very much and I'm sorry if I went over time.
That's brilliant. Thanks, Peter. I'm not even sure I bought you coffee. I think you just had your own, to be fair, um, but you still ended up <laughs> speaking. Um, so thanks for that input. There's huge interest um, in how these will work. Um, so there may we may get to have questions for you later or um, we may need another whole session uh, on how these will work. Um, we're just going to have a quick look at the results of the first poll. Um, if Colette, I know, can pop them up and we'll see what you said. Um, before we go to our last speaker. Um, I haven't seen the results yet, so I'm interested to know what you all think. Okay, so how important is it to you that specialist family law courts are developed around the country under proposed legislation? 93% said extremely important. Cool, that's why you're here, I guess. Um, how satisfied are you that these new family law courts will only be available regionally? Um, I think the highest there is somewhat satisfied and there's a lot of people who have concerns and a minority not satisfied and a minority completely satisfied. So a more mixed picture there. But I think that's interesting and especially given what Peter's been saying, I suppose it's a bit of a challenge to us that we all have to be leaders in our own spheres to make this work. And we'll have to look at that, I suppose, in the coming months as well. So, so many thanks to you for, for contributing to that. It's really interesting. Um, so now uh, our, fi our final um, panellist is um, His Honour Judge Colin Daly, President of the District Court, known to many people. Um, I uh, first appointed the District Court in 2012 and he was working in Carlo Kilkenny since 2015. And before being appointed to the Judiciary, President Daly was the Managing Solicitor of the Northside Community Law Centre in Dublin. So actually comes from a similar background to many of us um, in the community and voluntary sector. And President Daly is going to tell us a little bit about the innovations and practice responses that happened on the ground during COVID. So thank you very much for being with us today. Um, and uh, thanks for sharing your experience and expertise. Very good. Thank you, Karen. And uh, thank you for inviting me to speak today. And thanks to one family for that also. Um, as Peter mentioned, uh, the last time that Peter and Duna and I spoke at the same event, which was on the 6th of March, the district judges family conference, or the district judges conference. Um, within less than a week, uh, the whole world seemed to change. The economy shut down, uh, the courts closed except to urgent business, and uh, life has never been the same since. Um, so I thought that was a coincidence until today, we're on the same platform, we experienced all these uh, technical difficulties. <laughs> Sorry, Peter, Pete, or sorry, Colin, there's some terrible sound issues just happened there for us, I think, uh, judging by other people's faces as well. So we'll just go again, um, so, some interference. So maybe if all the panellists can turn, can mute, and then we'll just try again. Sorry, Colin. Okay. Going no, there's there? something interfering there. Is there anything in the room with you, I wonder? No. The only thing on the phone, but that's switched off. Yeah, okay. okay. Well, we'll, we'll, we'll give it a go. Right. Sorry about that. Okay, um, very good. First of all, I was thanking you for inviting me. I was commenting that uh, bad, bad things might uh, occur every time Peter and Duna and I speak at the same event. Um, I hope that's not going to follow through this time. Uh, the last time, uh, it, it seemed like the world almost came to a halt. Um, but at this point in time, uh, we're hopefully through at least the first phase and uh, we're starting to look at life again. Um, the approach that I'm going to take today is to review the district court's response to COVID-19, uh, particularly with regard to how it affected our family and our childcare courts. Um, like Peter, I'm going to reflect on what I consider the lessons that I've learned as the president of the district court from this experience. And then I'm probably going to take a more immediate term view as to how these lessons might inform future delivery of family law courts particularly in the district court. Um, so really to look at the district court's response to uh, COVID-19 in the family and the childcare courts, um, it started on the 12th of March when the district court issued a notice. Um, I, I issued a notice on behalf of the district court saying that we were significantly reducing business, uh, but the severity of the situation quickly um, meant that on the 13th of March, um, I issued a further notice on behalf of the district court saying that we would only open for urgent business and urgent business in the area of family law was uh, considered to be applications for protection uh, for domestic violence cases um, and, and in the area of childcare law applications for emergency care orders, extensions of interim care orders and care orders themselves 
and also applications for urgent interim care orders. Um, in the week or 10 days that followed, um, it became clear that the public really needed and required um, some further guidance as to what um, this decision or these decisions meant and would mean uh, to the orders, the family or the, the orders that they were currently trying to work and trying to work in a new way. Um, so that led to a, a, to a family law statement issuing from me on the 24th of March. And um, this statement here, I tried to give advice to people regarding how they should approach current access orders, maintenance orders and issues around guardianship. And uh, like one family and many other organisations, including the Law Society and the Bar, um, we urged parents to try to agree tempor temporary variations in light of the public health guidelines that were in place at the time, many of which continue to still be in place. And also, uh, we directed parties to other organisations for support. Um, also on the 24th of March, um, I issued some practice directions which applied in the Dublin area, dealing with consent extensions of interim care orders and family law consent adjournments could be dealt with by email um, and so on. On the 8th of May then, a further district court notice was issued by me. And at this time, uh, I decided that urgent matters could be extended uh, to include applications for breach of access and maintenance, which occurred during the lockdown period. And also they remote, uh, the, providing for the facility of remote callovers and hearings in some cases. Um, I further uh, drew attention to the fact that consent orders uh, could be uh, dealt with by emailing court offices. And in the area of childcare, um, I directed that all interim care orders access disputes, part heard cases, and indeed some care order cases could resume. Um, this uh, order, this notice of the 8th of May was made after consultation uh, with um, stakeholders, uh, including uh, NGO representatives and community representatives. Um, the next action occurred on the 19th of May uh, when I issued a practice direction, uh, which is called the Live Tele TV Link Practice Direction. And it essentially provides uh, for remote hearings um, in the district court in the areas of civil law, which will have a big effect on family law and childcare cases. And indeed, I issued guidelines in that practice direction for how childcare cases might be heard remotely. Um, since the 13th of March, um, we in the district court have provided a full schedule of services across over 40 locations all around the country on an almost daily basis. Um, the service may have been reduced, um, but we have been there uh, to ensure that there has been access to the courts uh, where it has been absolutely necessary. And just to reflect at this point, um, I would really like to thank uh, the members of the court service staff um, who really, uh, in extraordinarily difficult circumstances, uh, rose to the occasion and really turned around to achieve things uh, in days and weeks uh, that would ordinarily take months to, take, to, to, to put in place. And I'd also like to thank my colleagues on the district court bench um, who provided these necessary services throughout that time. So that's what we did in the district court um, over the last number of months. And so I'd like to now just reflect on the lessons that I hope that we have learned and certainly the lessons that I will take away from this experience. And here I, I, I've learned about the absolute need to keep courts accessible for emergency orders. Um, Peter has kindly provided me with regular data on domestic violence applications uh, that are being received in the district court uh, during the uh, response to the pandemic. And in the figures that he's provided to me this week, um, his figures show a 17% increase in protection order applications on the same period last year, and an almost 30% increase on the same period in 2018. And now Peter knows that judges mightn't be the best with percentages, um, but if my maths are correct, um, this shows a very significant, I think, um, increase in demand, but also a demand that the district court was able to meet and remains able to meet. I know that there are other challenges in this regard, 
and I hope that we'll be able to find ways to work around those other challenges in time. Another lesson that I've learned is the importance that the district court has in adjudicating disputes between families and how this becomes especially acute in times of crisis, but particularly in a situation where the crisis is external to the family. And indeed, um, we have not been insensitive or immune uh, to the effect that the decision to only deal with emergency business has had for many families uh, throughout the country. Uh, but these decisions were the right decisions, I feel, uh, given the public health concerns at the time. I also learned that we need to develop new ways of accessing courts, um, including by email and by remote video access, as I've described in the actions that we've taken. And I think we need to look and continue to look at what new ways we can uh, adopt uh, to ensure access to courts um, in such times. And I've also learned about the importance of communicating with the public and engaging with stakeholders um, at all times, but particularly at times uh, when things are changing fast and how important it is uh, to keep uh, communicating with everybody around what those changes are going to mean. And one of the particular lessons that I've learned and something I haven't quite um, managed to resolve yet is the particular difficulty that we have noticed in hearing the voice of the child uh, in circumstances like the circumstances through which we've just lived. And um, I was very interested to hear what Anthony Douglas has had to say um, in this regard generally, um, but perhaps uh, this is a topic that might bear um, a session all on its own. So if these are the key lessons that I've learned, um, I'm now looking to the future delivery of the family law courts in the district court setting. And in looking at the immediate future, um, I have to take into account that at least some restrictions, public health restrictions, are likely to be with us for some time. And I also think that this generation, our generation, uh, will live in the shadow of a pandemic, uh, which will influence how we plan future services. Um, I think it will always be in the back of our minds, uh, how do we manage this service if this happens again? And courts will need to be flexible and responsive um, to another localised lockdown or a national lockdown even, uh, if this is to happen in the coming months. And I think a key part of the developments in the family courts in the immediate future uh, will be uh, with the development of remote courts. Now, remote courts in family law and in the district court in particular um, provide us with certain challenges, uh, most of the challenges to which there are some solutions. Um, the first challenge that I would identify with regard to the rollout of remote courts in family law uh, may, might be considered to be legislative limitations. Um, the Section 20 of the Courts of Justice Act requires a judge to be sitting in a place within his or her district um, in order to hold that court properly. Um, so this requires the judge to travel physically to the court. Um, Section 26 of the Civil Law Miscellaneous Provisions Act, um, which deals with giving evidence by way of live television link, um, is, what the, is the legislation upon which we base our ability to conduct remote courts. Uh, but we cannot you cannot commence a case uh, without physically attending at a court office. Um, so these are some legislative challenges, and in particular, the district court uh, can only work within the legislative limitations that are placed upon it. Um, so the solutions that, here, that, that, that we might need to these kinds of difficulties uh, would be legislation specific to the electronic filing of documents uh, or for the holding of remote courts, which would be welcomed. Um, now, legislation is not a matter for the judiciary, so I'm not going to take this any further, um, but uh, that's something that Una may uh, wish to come back on. Um, also, in developing remote courts and family law, there is the challenge of the in-camera rule. And uh, the challenge for us is how to ensure that those engaged with remote hearings will not record or publish the proceedings. Um, this is a, a real concern. And uh, we certainly have some experience in the district court 
of the in-camera rule being breached in this way. Um, solutions to this might be with the creation of specific offences, uh, but other uh, solutions that don't require um, legislative change might be through the development of some trusted intermediaries uh, who might be able to assist uh, parties who wish to, who might find it difficult to come to court. And we're currently engaged in conversations with some domestic violence support services about how remote applications uh, for domestic violence ex parte orders could be achieved. Um, another challenge for remote courts and family law is the challenge of dis digital disadvantage. Um, not all of the people who may wish to engage with district court uh, will be able to engage with remote courts. Uh, so for example, people with intellectual difficulties or physical difficulties, um, people with literacy difficulties, or people with um, access to poor broadband or insufficient broadband um, may find themselves disadvantaged. However, um, I think the creating of access for those that can engage in remote courts will create greater capacity for those who can't uh, to attend a more traditional or corporeal kind of court. So if we look to where we go from here, um, the, the district court intends to return towards its fullest service as public health guidelines will allow from the 1st of September. And I believe that we can only really achieve this uh, by placing, placing greater emphasis on the scheduling of courts and hearings as much as possible uh, to regulate the flow uh, of people uh, th safely through our courts. With family law cases, we can provide a relatively, we can relatively easily provide a safe court environment. Um, however, the gathering of large numbers of people in the court environments waiting for cases to come on uh, can no longer be the norm. And indeed, traditional ways of settling cases, I don't think can any longer be facilitated. Um, so I would encourage parties uh, to mediate and to settle cases where at all possible. And the old culture, I'm going to call it the old culture, of waiting to come to the court building uh, to start entering into negotiations um, is no longer going to be physically possible in the new reality that we'll be looking at over the coming months. Um, the capacity uh, for the district court to meet the demands in family law cases um, is going to be challenged. Um, this may be less of a challenge in Dublin and Limerick and Cork, where we have uh, essentially dedicated family law centres or childcare hearing centres. Um, however, the demands and uh, the public health guidelines will really challenge our ability to meet the demand. But certainly for many districts outside of Dublin, um, the ability to meet the demand in family law cases um, within public health guidelines is going to severely impact how family law is, may be conducted in the district court. I don't think that it's going to be possible to schedule hearings according to the demand with the resources that are available. And so we do have some very big challenges to face in the months ahead. And I think in the coming months, uh, we're going to see at uh, the need for the dedicated type of family law division uh, that Ms Buckley has described, and we're going to see that more acutely than ever. Um, I don't want to end on an entirely negative note, and I do want to note that in the interim, I expect that there will be greater use of remote callovers to schedule hearings. And um, this has always been, uh, this has already been rolled out on a trial basis in Galway, and it may or may not continue there. Uh, but it's also going to be trialed in Tipperary and Limerick. And I also hope that we're going to be able to do, uh, wherever possible, remote hearings. And indeed, I myself am going to be taking the first two days of remote hearings in Dolphin House later this month, uh, when various applications are going to be made um, remotely. So we're very much looking forward uh, to having that uh, started and, and, and starting to roll out in the DMD. Thank you very much. That's great. Thanks, Colin. It's funny for everybody. I feel we need an applause button. I can see what the what, what the, the atmosphere for matches is like. That was great. Thank you so much for explaining the kinds of responses people had to make very quickly on the ground, both the, the judiciary and the court service to try and meet the needs of people and prioritise them. 
Um, certainly in one family, the main issue we heard about uh, for the first two months probably of COVID were in relation to access and contact issues. And I think you've acknowledged that. Um, we just constantly heard from people who were in very difficult circumstances where they did not want their children to go on a visit uh, for various concerns uh, in relation to health issues, people who wouldn't let their children go back to perhaps their main residence, people who didn't want to see their children. So it was every kind of imaginable scenario people were struggling with, parents were trying to figure out what's best for their children. Um, so, so very difficult. Um, and, and I think what you've said in terms of uh, COVID being with us for a while and needing to, to respond and, and keep up with people um, is, is very interesting to note, along with um, try and mediate and don't decide on the, the steps of the courts. Um, that's certainly not good for children or parents in, in our experience. Um, so we're just going to go and get the results of our second poll before we go to our Q&A session. Um, so if we can pop them up, that would be great. Um, we've had a lot of questions in. OK, let's see. Sorry. Who should be the most important people in family law cases, in your opinion? So an overwhelming um, amount for children, which is great, uh, over 91 percent. But really interesting, a very significant amount of people saying parents should also be at 20 percent and then lesser degrees for the various people working, I suppose, around um, family law systems. Um, does child safeguarding need to be the central issue? Overwhelming, yes, but a small amount of people saying no. So very interesting results. And I suppose what we see all the time in one family is there could be two parents, both of whom absolutely care about their children and have their children's best interest at heart, but totally disagree about what that means and what that looks like. Um, so uh, it, it's, it's uh, interesting and ongoing work, I think. Um, so I'm delighted now to hand over to um, uh, Sinead Gibney, who is going to chair um, the Q&A session of um, our panel. And just to say, sorry, I meant to say earlier, we are on Twitter. If anyone wants to get involved in Twitter, please do. We're using the hashtag Family Law today. Um, Sinead Gibney is currently the chair of One Family, and she's also the incoming chief commissioner of IREC, which is the Irish Human Rights and Equality Commission. Um, and she has been monitoring the questions. So thanks, Sinead. Thanks, Minion Karen. Um, and thanks uh, to all of our speakers. I found that session really, really fascinating and very informative. We've had a wonderful um, array of questions coming in. Uh, just a couple of things to say first and foremost is that we will share all of the questions with the panel because I think we will only obviously get to put a sample to them in the time that we have, but we'll be happy to pass along those questions because I'm sure they will be of interest uh, to all the members of the panel. Um, and just if I can direct one comment actually to the panel yourselves, if there's a specific question that you've seen that you'd like to address when you have the floor, please, uh, please feel free uh, to do so. Um, so I think just judging on time, we're probably going to have uh, a, about time for about three rounds of questions. So I have started to break them down um, as such into a first group of uh, specific questions and then a second group of specific questions. And then what I might do for the final round is to summarize some of the dominant topics that are coming through. Um, so those do topics really being, I suppose, some of the logistics around uh, the, the new service, um, domestic violence and parental alienation. But I will start off, as I say, with some of the more specific ones. Um, and uh, I'm going to kick off with one that came in quite early from Angela Keevney, but which has been um, echoed by, by many of the other questions uh, that have been submitted. So Angela says, thank you for your excellent presentation, Una. Will there be any provision in the bill for the voice of the child or young person? to be heard in access proceedings, particularly in domestic violence cases. Currently, their voice is either unheard or ignored, and there is a bias towards an abus abusive parent being entitled to access. Um, so that voice of the child question has come through uh, a number of times. Um, so that was directed towards Una, but of course, if there are other uh, panelists um, who have something to add on that, uh, that would be super. Um, I have, and excuse me now while I'm just uh, scrolling through these. Um, the next one coming through from uh, Dara, uh, Dara Bohan. Um, Do you think our family law system will see radical and quick change within the next few months because of what families will have experienced the last few months? 
or what children will have witnessed in homes. And I think we've heard some of the um, uh, comments from, from our last couple of speakers in particular around COVID um, and what that has meant for people. But I think it's a really interesting question. Um, so do you think our family law system will see radical and quick change within the next few months because of what families will have experienced in the last few months or what children will have witnessed um, in their homes? And then I have one more that I wanted to put um, to the panel, three, sorry. Um, why is there not a default, this question comes in from Ken McIntyre Barn. Why is there not a default child custody split when relationships break down? The absence of this leads to chaos and usually leads to one parent grabbing control of the children and the slowness of the court system to deal with these cases results in potential alienation of children by one or other parent during the time lag, not to mention the psychological impact on the children. If a de default split was in place, then the courts could deal with the exceptions to the split rather than dealing with uh, all cases. Um, so they're the three questions for this round and I might kick off with Una, please, given that one of them uh, was directed uh, to you. But of course, I'll be looking for all the panelists to contribute on that. Thanks, Una. Yeah, no problem. And it's an interesting question. I, I suppose I think I had better explain. Um, uh, and I know Anthony has probably wowed you and dangled lots of, um, you know, many decades of reform in front of you. But we cannot run before we walk. And a starting place for reform in Ireland has to be that we create a system of courts with a dedicated uh, intention of dealing with family law matters. From there, many of the types of reforms that Anthony has spoken about happening in the UK um, will start to make their needs felt, if I can put it that way. In other words, once you've got ju specialist judges dealing with special courts, other aspects of the way in which family law reform needs to occur will start to become clearer and clearer and clearer. But we have to start somewhere, and this is where we're starting. And it's, it's, I suppose that, that, that is uh, an important point. I have no doubt, uh, sorry, and the other point I would make is that the bill that is to be produced makes no substantive change to substantive family law. It simply creates the system of courts within which existing family law will be applied. And then, as I say, the issues that need to be addressed within those family uh, and uh, relationships and child child care relations and all that will will start to become clearer and clearer and um, law and law reform is an ongoing process and we, we you know that, that that people have to accept that so i suppose to a degree what i'm saying to people is let's try and get this reform done it's 1975 was when the law reform commission produced their first report if we that was 45 years ago it will be um, a very important thing to get this done now, and then we can start to work our way through the other types of reforms that, we, that will be needed, that we, we know are needed. Um, but I have no doubt that as we're working our way through the drafting of the heads of the bill, issues like how the voice of the child can be heard will start to come through, and th those are the kind of things that we will need to be done. I, I also want to just talk, um, and it's just in response to Colin's points about COVID um, and things that need to be done there. And uh, in response to the change of will we see radical change in the family courts over the next few months, uh, with the very greatest of respect to your questioner, the short answer to that is no. Um, when, was, when was the last time we saw radical change in the court system over the first few months? Although I have to say that uh, President Daly and his colleagues have delivered more change in the last 10 weeks than probably was seen in the previous 20 years. Um, and that, that is extremely important what was done. And some of that required no legislative reform, no changes of, of any description, simply a change in mindset. For example, around the scheduling of, of court appearances and family cases, which is a really, really important and um, kind of customer, for, I know that people in family justice cases aren't customers, but it's a customer friendly move that requires nothing more than a change of mindset. And what I would say is that we're very conscious that there are, uh, there are, however, aspects of the way the courts run their business that do require legislative reform. We're working very anxiously on those, um, and those arise in both the criminal and the civil and family courts. Um, and the very first um, proposed memorandum to government that the minister got on her desk, and it went up yesterday, uh, was on uh, emergency COVID-related uh, amendments which um, Peter will be conscious of and, and President Daly, that we've been working in a separate group on, on looking at what those are. Um, and then separately, there's a civil law amendments bill 
that is being actively worked on, which should underpin and do more of those things for the longer term. So that relates to things like statements of truth, e-filing and so on and so forth. Those will be hugely important and indeed the remote courts. Um, so those will be hugely important, I know, to the work of, uh, well, of the district court, particularly with all the, the throughput that the district court has, both, both on the criminal and, and family and civil side. Um, can I reiterate um, and just um, I, I welcome very much uh, President Daly's notes of caution around people trying to settle cases because there is simply no way, and I, obviously Peter and President Daly are closer to this, but we're very conscious of the fact there's no way the Irish courts can, can go back to their previous level of productivity. It just isn't feasible in the era of social distancing and so on and so forth. Um, I, I would think that, um, just to close off, um, I, I participated in a webinar um, a number of weeks ago, uh, an OECD one, in which um, court people who, who are in my role around the world participated, and all of them said how unprepared their court system was for the effects of the pandemic. Um, and I, I think it's fair to say that the Irish court system is heavily paper-based, um, very much dependent on people turning up physically in court buildings and so forth, was unprepared. And a 19th century system trying to deal with a 21st century pandemic. Um, but what has been remarkable is how um, the court service and the judiciary working together have really tried to adapt as best they can to that. So it's, it's really important, I think, that all users of the system try and um, make sure that they, they match that level of achievement and endeavour and use the new systems as best they can, particularly around remote hearings. So uh, um, hopefully that answers some of those questions. Thanks. Thank you very much, Una. Um, I might invite Anthony to please um, add some comments. And I know some of those questions were possibly directed uh, or framed around the Irish situation, but I'm sure you have plenty of uh, comments from your own experience, Anthony. Thank you. Um, well, just um, to build on what Una said in the Irish um, context, uh, I do think it's possible to start with law reform, but simultaneously make strides towards understanding um, the voices of children. So I don't think that necessarily needs to be um, a rigid sequencing. For example, uh, at some point, these family law cases have to get into mainstream children's services. And one way is to look at a better definition of the emotional damage being done and to stop the rigid divisions between um, Tushler dealing with certain categories of case and not touching others. So I think one of the dangers that we haven't quite dealt with ourselves, because one of the downfalls of a specialist organisation like Kafka's is, um, other organisations say, well, you're dealing with it, we don't need to. But when you don't have a specialist organisation, it's even more important to get mainstream organisations more involved. And that's what I meant by giving children equal status and therefore by changing perhaps the eligibility criteria, thresholds for their involvement in this work. And that, that's a different, it's an already funded group of services, but it's defining fundamentally these children as children in significant need, not um, as a residual service in a court. So um, I, th I understand exactly what um, Una said, but I think some, some progress can be made simultaneously with a number of work streams that you might look at them and think have to follow on one from another. Um, but I think what we learned is you have to try and make some progress, uh, at least preparatory progress on all fronts. Okay, thanks very much. And, and Colin and Peter, would you like to jump in with any comments on, on those questions? Colin first, maybe? Um, thank you. I, I suppose really looking at the, the first question, which was to do with the voice of the child, um, I think it's important to recognise where we've come in the last 20 years with regard to the voice of the child. We, we may not be quite where um, Kafka is at the moment, but we're a lot further along the road than we were, certainly when I was in practice at, at Northside Community Law Centre. Um, we have the 
there's a provision within the, the 2018 Domestic Violence Act which allows uh, for the views of the child to be taken into consideration where an order in respect to the child is being sought. Um, we have the Guardianship of Infants Act, which was amended by the Child and Family Relationships Act of 2014, uh, which at Section 31 provides a welfare checklist that courts should take into consideration and also provides under Section 32, uh, particularly to the district court now, um, a, a vehicle whereby the views of the child can be given uh, by a, 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 an appropriate professional. And I think that's probably been one of the most transformative um, pieces of legislation with regard to the voice of the child in private family law proceedings um, in the last number of years. And I think we're only really beginning to see the impact of it in courts uh, as those kind of reports uh, become more frequent and they're introducing us to uh, assessments of um, what is going on in terms of the family, but from the, the point of the child in ways that we weren't exposed to before. Um, so while we, want, we may not be there, um, we, we have st certainly started down that road and, and I certainly hope that, you know, over the coming years, if the policymakers so decide that, that we will develop on that. With regard to radical change, um, <laughs> I, I think there has been some fairly radical change um, in the last number of months. Um, but, but I suppose they're radical changes in an, in an administrative kind of way. And I think we have seen that there are some administrative improvements that we can make. Um, and, and I think, um, you know, that that Pandora's box has been opened and it, it is going to be interesting to see over the coming months how we can best use those tools. Um, and certainly then any legislative change would be a matter for the other uh, organs of state. Um, with regard to the default access arrangement, um, it would be wonderful if families fitted neatly into default situations. Um, but any of us, whether we're judges or lawyers or policymakers or support services uh, who work with families, know that the needs of each family is very individual. And what will work for one family uh, may not work for another. And I, I think really what we need to focus on is uh, helping the parents to be able to repair their relationship to a sufficient degree uh, to be able to take the focus from themselves and to start looking at things from the child's point of view. And if we can enable them to do that, um, then that, that would be a much better way of moving forward. Lovely. Thanks, Colin. And finally, Peter, do you have any comments to add on this? Just a couple. I think I've just been, if people have wondered why I'm peering into it, I'm reading it on my iPads, the various questions. But I mean, the, the, in relation to the, the, the voice of the child issue, I mean, there's legislative provisions around that. Uh, there's the issue of resourcing of how reports are prepared. Uh, in, there would be a view that in every case, you don't need a long report. And I thought Anthony's presentation earlier on about the 100 page reports down to six pages, you know, because let's be honest about it. Uh, you know, some things are complicated and need long reports, but most aren't. Uh, and sometimes the voice of the child is very simple. It's just to, to hear it. However, you know, we are inadequately resourced at the moment. On occasions, judges have to sort of literally, with a registrar, go into their chamber, hear the voice of the child in appropriate situations. And that's completely inadequate and, and wrong. And, and Colin's colleagues are, are very unsatisfied with that and they're right to be unsatisfied with it. And we as a court service try, have to try to facilitate and, and improve that if we can. One of the comments was from, from a colleague in, in the Department of Children uh, who suggested would well, could we look at remote um, remote hearings around that or, or ICT or visual links or whatever you would think and the answer is yes we should be looking at that and again it's about so the child wouldn't necessarily have to be present in court I think there might need to be a legislative change to allow for that and, and President Daly alluded to some of the changes we needed to do around uh, video link uh, and and the necessity of court venues etc so we need some some changes around that so you know the, the, so I'll concentrate exclusively on that. There are simple ways, I suspect, that we can facilitate how the voice of the child in some of those cases that are simple, we can facilitate. The complicated cases do require the reports. Uh, and, uh, and again, there was like some questions around the qualifications in that around you know, people preparing the reports. Uh, you know, I, that, that's a policy matter and, and that, that's not for court service or for the judiciary, that's a matter for the department. But I think, you know, the, the people do need to have minimum qualifications to prepare these reports. Um, 
uh, but I might disagree with, and, and all of us might disagree uh, about who they would be, but you know, certain types of qualifications, people who work with children, people who are used to doing that, I think that's as a minimum. Uh, and uh, so that, those are just my comments. In relation to um, fundamental change of law quickly, um, I, I better stay silent on that. <laughs> Okay, thanks a million, Peter. And in the interest of time, I'm going to now condense uh, my two rounds that I had into, into one round, actually, so that we can go around one more time um, through, through the speakers. So I have a few specific questions, and then we're going to look at some, a summary of some of the topics. And I'm sure you, uh, as the panel, have had a look through some of the comments around the topics of parental alienation um, and domestic violence. But I had a couple of specifics first um, from uh, Peter McGuire, who asked, um, domestic abuse support organizations have consistently highlighted how there is a lack of connections between the family law and criminal law courts in Ireland. So this is really about the connection between the two. So an abuse victim, adult or child, may not always be able to raise in family court matters, which are now being considered by a criminal court, including physical or sexual abuse and coercive control. Is this reform being considered is the specific question, but particularly any other comments you might have on that. Um, uh, I thought there was an interesting question in from Jim Sheehan um, asking, what place does ongoing research play in the new proposals within the court service? So perhaps if, if, if maybe Peter Aruna or, or whoever had uh, some comments on that. Um, and from Theresa Blake, um, it is envisaged that the probation and welfare service will be brought back into, form, into the family courts to provide reports. Sorry, is it envisaged that the probation and welfare service will be brought back into family courts to provide reports or will there be a new dedicated service? Um, so those are some of the um, specific ones. In relation to the topic of domestic violence, we've had um, a number of different questions. Uh, we had one comment in the chat function about, um, I suppose, the gendered um, perception of domestic violence that, um, uh, that uh, encouraging us to consider it um, across both genders. We were also had a question in from the Women's Council um, around this. Um, when there is a domestic abuse, are parents still required to participate in positive parenting program? So I guess some of these are around the policy and some of them are around more the practice side of things. Um, and in terms of parental alienation, there was a huge amount of comments um, and questions at the, at the outset. Most of them, I suppose, really directed towards Anthony, because there does seem to be a perception that in terms of parental alienation as a topic, the UK is far ahead. Um, in terms of its recognition of parental alienation and how it deals with it. So in particular, if you could um, give us your thoughts on that, Anthony. Um, and then I suppose just to capture some of the logistical pieces, I mean, there's lots around kind of waiting areas and some of the, you know, logistics around um, the court. So I suppose maybe as a kind of summary um, question, you know, what does it, what does the ideal family law course look like? And maybe Colin and Peter might be able to give us some thoughts on that around the processes and services that you want to see uh, in place in this service um, as it evolves. Um, so perhaps I could go with the same order again, maybe if I can go with Una, Anthony, uh, Colin and Peter, would that be all right? Yes, except I'm not sure what I can say because a okay. lot of these questions are extremely detailed about policy um, and they shade over to the domestic violence side, which I'm actually not the policy holder for. Um, so um, I, I, um, I think what would be best is if there, if there are specific questions that maybe want to be collated by one family and I can, I can endeavour to get a reply to those that might be the best thing to do rather than get weighed in and, and end up committing us to something that we're not intending to do. So it would just be better that way, if that's okay with you. Ed. Of course, Una, absolutely. Anthony? Um, yes, well, I'd just say, I think, because time is short, that I think there's a, a place for an up-to-date operating manual about family law cases that might say something about neglect and abuse as it operates in in the real in real time today because it's not quite what it was in the textbooks that uh, for example um neglect in affluent families that's um a, a, an element of understanding about neglect um that really wasn't there in any training or thinking 15 years ago um adolescent neglect the uh, Adolescents thought much more in terms of their troubled behaviour or troublesome behaviour than for the neglect they might be going through. Um, coercive control, um, hugely important now in domestic abuse assessments. Um, parental alienation, I would see in that same 
category that it undoubtedly exists. Um, it's quite widespread. It's distinct from where you simply undermine your former partner. Um, undermining is a regrettable fact of separation. Parental alienation is a form, in my view, of emotional abuse. So to recognize it within the, the way you classify abuse and neglect as mainstream and to write that down into operating procedures, I think is quite important. Um, the other one I'd add is the speed of re recruitment into gangs. We've certainly got that in many, mostly in cities, but increasingly gangs follow the money in affluent areas as well. And that speed of recruitment into exploitation and sexual abuse is often instant. You know, as a parent, you can go to work at, well, perhaps not these days, you're working from home, but, but a few months ago, you'd go to work at eight o'clock, you come back at five, your child is on the edge of being recruited into something. And, and when you look at how the process is, you wouldn't believe it. It's so quick, fast, social media based, but it's a form of abuse. So I do think it's important to, to catalog contemporary abuse and neglect including parental alienation in a straightforward way um, but it's much wider um, the, than a niche um, dispute in a family law case in court. Thank you so much Anthony. Colin? There's actually very little I can say in response to this. Um, the nexus between family and crime in with regards to, to domestic abuse or domestic violence cases. Um, all I can do is just reflect the fact that one is a civil process, the other is a criminal process, and there are uh, legislative and evidential rules that simply must be followed um, that create that divide. Um, with regard to the question of parental alienation, and I, I go back to what I said earlier about Section 32 reports, um, it, it, you know, it depends on what kind of view of parental alienation you take. If you look at parenting, parental alienation as an assessment that a suitably qualified professional must conduct and give a diagnosis almost, um, that, that's one way of looking at parental alienation. But, but perhaps the other way of looking at it is, is, is there a series of facts that can be established that in effect show that that one parent is causing the alienation of the other um, so i think you you need to to look at you know, what you've got and, and, and how you can achieve the right result perhaps and that's the recognition of what's happening to the child in those circumstances and um, i think we're beginning we're very much beginning to see this emerging as, as an issue um, in the family law courts in ireland and i think it's particularly through the assistance of the psychologists who have been providing Section 32 reports and have been looking at it in these ways and that are helping us to achieve that. Um, the questions with regard to research and the Probation and Welfare Services introduction uh, to the family courts, I'm going to leave for Peter to deal with. Thank you so much. <laughs> I'm not sure <laughs> I'm thanking Colin at all, but anyway. <laughs> um, I, I'll go back to that. Um, yeah, just, I mean, there's a couple of questions, I think, um, many of name, whose names are recognised and former colleagues, and nice to hear from you all. Um, no, in terms of Jim Sheen's point about research feeding into um, legislation, said, look, these are evidence, that, you know, departments like to credit themselves on, on evidence-based decision-making and, and around that. And I think, clearly, if there is research, that, and, I, and I'm sure that the department have looked at the policy considerations around this, have looked at that issue, and, and that's reflected in that. If there's obviously any new learning there is in relation to this, obviously must feed into that process. And, and you know, the... The presentation of Anthony's in particular shows the importance, which is the which is the the, the, the probation welfare service issue, which historically used to do uh, probation report or do reports for family law proceedings, and CAF CAS, I understand, have a role in that uh, in the UK. I mean, there, there's a very there's an argument for that. I know many of President Daly's colleagues would certainly like that to have those supports available to them, and. Um, but I mean, whether there's the resources for that and whether policy decisions are made to resource that, uh, that becomes a policy issue. So I'm, I'm handing it over, I'm back to Una, who will, will, will not come back in. But I mean, it is, it is, it is an issue about resources and it is, it is something that's really important to think about. Uh, and I think it's certainly a very valid discussion to have because it reflects the voice of the child discussion, reflects 
better decision making if you can resort, you know, those sort of reports can, can help judges make better decisions. And um, the domestic violence issue, I was really interested in what, 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 what President Daly said in relation to that. I'm a former criminal lawyer. The, the, the two proceedings were, were rarely dealt with together. Uh, and there are very good reasons for that because there must be a, a penalty. However, uh, you know, there's no doubt that much of the sort of some of the time some of the, the penalty can involve attending at the probation service at that stage and that they're going to parental, uh, parental law um, uh, courses uh, and to deal with perpetrators abuse that you know does you know otherwise the cycle continues uh, you know so uh, imprisonment may not be necessarily the answer it is in some cases but it but it may not necessarily be another case it may well be that if somebody attends a, a course and actually changes their behavior not just because they're dictated to by the court but actually changes their behavior i think that's a better outcome for everybody but you know so those are other issues and finally then the issue in relation to um, the resourcing and, and the type of, of what, what, what a, a family law uh, court will look like well it won't look like many of the district courts that we have around the country that all of you are unhappy with it won't look like that and they're not adequate uh, and i'm not going to stand over and say that that the facilities that we provide, uh, we, we, we are, we provide because they must be done within districts, that's the facilities that unfortunately we have and without more resources, that's unfortunately. And, and are they inadequate? Yes, they are. Are they inadequate for criminal proceedings? Yes, they are. Uh, we are building better, we have built better courts uh, in many of our county towns and we're continuing to do that. And there will be further, uh, there, there's four or five more county towns where there will be better resources. The family law courts, what they will look like into the future. The Limerick pilot, which is something that we looked at already and which I mentioned and alluded to, will be will be dedicated to family law uh, on the days where family law are done there, which is almost every day. And there will be lots of consultation rooms. There will be places for the legal aid board will be resident on site. There will be mediation service. And there will be consultation things. The consultations, as I've said in my presentation, will be conducted with dignity. Uh, actually in, in, in offices, uh, consultation rooms as opposed to in corridors within the earshot frequently and certainly within sight uh, of possibly a perpetrator of domestic violence or, or, or an estranged uh, husband or wife. Uh, so, and that's just not acceptable. And I'm, you know, look, and I don't, um, I, I, I'm not going to pretend. Um, that Hammond Lane, when it happens, will be really really good and, and it will look fantastic and the minister I know previously committed to it and uh, I think we will hopefully see some progress in relation to that with the new minister uh, and I think that will be state of the art and what we'll endeavour to do is try to reflect that right throughout our state as far as we can but it goes back to the point I made earlier on in relation to we can't do that nor can it be done in every single centre and it can't be done that way uh, and it will mean choices and it will mean going to certain regional venues um, 12, 13, 14 of them, whatever it is, and there will not be one in every county. And that's going to be politically contentious. And that goes back to my point of leadership. And I really, I cannot, like if I leave all of you with that point, it comes back to, um, we don't live in a world of, 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 of open limited resources. And I know that sounds trite. And um, should we resource this area more? Of course we should. But that's the reality and choices that we all have to make. Uh, and what I'm asking all of you to do is that when that when that when when those proposals come out, to look at them fairly, to, to realise that we can resource each of those 12 or 14 centres properly, uh, that we would do so in a way that uh, that, that would stand uh, your, or your, your criticism and that would, would be properly resourced. Uh, and, then, and, and then I'd ask for your support in relation to it. Uh, so okay. I'll finish I'm Lovely. Thanks, Peter. Thanks so much. Una has just asked to jump in uh, quickly with one last comment. A huge thank you to everybody for the really great questions that have been submitted. And as I said, um, rest assured, they will be passed on to the, uh, to the panels, uh, panel members. But I'll, I'll allow Una just to jump in on one quick question and then we'll hand back over to Karen. Thank yeah, it's, it's, it's just to reinforce really what Peter said about resources. We're, we're, we're entering a really, really difficult time um, and there's going to be less money around to do really valuable things even like this. And this, this reform, we made it clear from the get go required additional resources to deliver it. It cannot be done within the current um, confines of, 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 of the inadequate way we currently deliver family law. Um, so it involves us trying to get some additionality, reprioritizing other work and other, other types of spending so that we take it away, for example, from the buildings and put it into case management systems or into judges that are needed to reform it or indeed into voice of the child type, type people or whatever comes down the tracks. Um, 
what I can say, and just please to reinforce what Peter is saying, access to justice does not mean you can go down to your local village and get into the district court. Access to justice is a much broader concept. It means that you get access to a decent system that is reasonably proximate to you and that delivers a decent result to you in a, in a short amount of, as short amount of time as possible. That's what access to justice is. It's not having 50 or 60 or 80 district courts sprinkled across the land. It's about having the right resources in the right places. And in Ireland, that really does mean approximately a dozen uh, family law centers um, where all of those resources are provided. And Peter is right, Hammond Lane, when it is built, we will hope would be a very high exemplar of that. And we're extremely hopeful that there will be a positive announcement in that space over the coming weeks um, once the minister has had a chance to, to look, at, look at that issue. So there is a bit of resource there, but it is going to be extremely tight. So I don't want people to think that this is going to be, um, you know, a shiny new family law system by Christmas. That's not going to work that way. But we are going to start and we are going to try and drive it through. And that's what's important. Thanks for allowing me to come back in, Sinead. Thanks for that. And many thanks to Sinead for facilitating that session. That was really great. Um, and thanks to so many people. There's still hundreds of you on the webinar, even though we are a little bit over time. So really appreciate that. Just to say there were a huge amount of questions and comments. We couldn't get through them all. And some of them it's really clear that some of you have gone through really difficult um, pr uh, processes yourselves. And I just want to acknowledge that because in one family, that's the business we're in. And if anyone would like to support from us, our helpline is open again tomorrow. Uh, and we're very happy to, to provide support if we can. Um, and I appreciate people's willingness um, to, to try and change things and, and to put questions out there. So there was lots of themes that came up that hopefully we can have some more of these um, and without all the glitches, of course, because we'll know more the next time. But lots of Voice of the Child, the New Family Law Centre and how to operationalise it, um, parental alienation, domestic violence, violent management of court assessments, how to start refocusing to a child-focused perspective, even if we don't have enough resources, how can we redeploy what we have? And Una's mentioned that, as has Anthony. Um, so lots to think about in the future. So I just want to close by formally thanking all our speakers for giving their time and expertise and just to say there was a huge amount of positive feedback for the speakers, um, which is great. So many thanks to Una Buckley, to Anthony Douglas, to Peter Mullen and to President Daly. Um, and of course to Sinead for facilitating. Um, and thanks to our communications team, Cathy and Noel, for helping with all the technical requirements. And it was just to say, in one family, we what we do, we do for children, and we 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 support their parents and we support the children directly, but we support the adults in their lives, um, in one parent families to try and make things um, a, as good as possible. And we really appreciate all the parents who put their trust in us and let us work with them because it's not always easy to do. And trying to share parenting and conflict is really really difficult. Um, and can't be underestimated and separating is really, really difficult. So just to let people know there is support, there's lots of other organizations as well to help people do it. Um, even if we're not where we want to be, there are, there are some supports there. So hopefully in the coming months and years, we can all work together to try and create a family law system that is worthy and will serve the most vulnerable in our society, who I think at this instance are children, their parents and separating families. Um, so I'll close there. We are recording this. We will send it out to you. It will be available on our social media platforms and website. And thank you very, very much. And thanks for sticking with us through uh, the challenges at the beginning as well. Thanks and bye bye.